Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to discuss the uh, rather controversial appointment of Tony Abbott, the former Prime Minister of Australia, to Britain's Board of Trade, or at least proposed appointment because nothing has been officially confirmed yet. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So, yes, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott being reported, widely reported, to be employed, maybe imminently, to help spearhead the UK's post-Brexit trade deals around the world. And in a lot of ways, you would think this would be a, a, an impressive appointment, certainly an interesting one. A recent head of government? Wow. But regardless of Abbott's political achievements, it's crucial. Um, and it's going to be a very challenging role and also a very public one as well. And you're going to need essentially two qualities one to be in tune with uh, you know the values of the uk as it sets out its stall to the world or at least the values you'd wish to claim we hold and secondly to be able to strengthen our hand in tough international negotiations from which we are already starting from a point of some weakness unfortunately abbott falls flat on both these counts because in terms of values is a complete mess of a man Labour's Shadow Secretary for Trade, Emily Thornberry, who is the opposite number for presumably Abbott's proposed boss, Liz Truss, said, On a personal level, I am disgusted that Boris Johnson thinks this offensive, leering, cantankerous, climate change denying, Trump worshipping misogynist is the right person to represent our country overseas. Of course, Thornberry wasn't being entirely fair there. Abbott isn't actually a climate change denier. He believes climate change is happening. He just thinks it's a good thing. So not really more helpful than a climate change denier, but we must be fair. But he is undoubtedly a sexist and has been called out for it many times in his own country in the past. And it would actually seem somewhat odd appointing him to a department that at the moment is run by a female minister, Liz Truss in this case. I mean, I would be thinking, well, would their working relationship even be productive if he has no respect for her? And could he even feign basic civility towards a female superior? But that is to presume that she would be his superior because we may need to think fourth dimensionally on this one. Apart from the fact I keep seeing in a couple of reports that it would be like a, a joint head of board of trade position. But also, uh, I mean, the details are very unclear about the appointment because the appointment hasn't officially been made um and it also worth mentioning that dominic cummings's you know overall scheme for the civil service includes getting rid of liz truss's department the department for international trade and industry with the trade part it's been, been broken up and the trade part being given to the foreign office now this is an interesting notion in itself because government departments tell you a lot about what the government's priorities are. So if there's a department for something, if there's a ministry, then it's considered important by government. And if it's a large department focused solely on that thing, then it's a top priority. If it's part of a smaller department that does other things as well, well, it's still important, but it's a much lower priority. So for example, policing, that's considered important, a top priority. So you have the Home Office to take charge of it. This is a large department and the head of that department, the Home Secretary, is one of the most senior members of government. That indicates that the government see it as a top priority. OK, this same government has slashed police numbers by 21,000 and shut down 600 police stations and more recently has made Priti Patel the Home Secretary. But they see it as more important than other areas that they've cut back on even more, you could argue. But then on the other hand, you have the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So they have a government department, so they're considered important. But it's a small department, so it's not considered as high a priority. And all of those three things, they don't have their own department for them. They're all mixed into the same department with the same cabinet minister. So they're a much lower priority. 
So by splitting up the department for trade and industry and passing them to other departments, what Boris Johnson is saying, I mean, it's Dominic Cummings, but Boris Johnson is the one who's authorising it. So what Boris Johnson is saying is that he doesn't think it's uh, important enough to have its own department. And he doesn't think it's as important as previous prime ministers because they did think it should have its own department. Uh, it's not worth having a cabinet minister in charge of it, for example. I mean, OK, sure, the trade part goes to the foreign office. There's a foreign secretary, but the foreign secretary deals with all sorts of things, you know. So it will be a junior minister that has, uh, you know, has this particular brief. And it will be in another department where it will have to fight it out for money from the budget with all the other parts of that department, which is a little odd. It is odd because when you consider we're at a time where we're going to be losing hundreds of trade agreements around the world overnight and well over a thousand agreements in general around the world on the same day. It's like 31st of December 2020, we have a load of trade agreements. 1st of January 2021, we have not very many. And at this point, the government is planning to abolish the department whose task it is to go out and get us new ones. I mean, you'd have thought, if anything, it would have expanded importance. The idea of putting the Trade Department in the Foreign Office, for example, Foreign Secretary at times will have international crises to deal with. But international trade negotiations are going to have to be going on all the time. You know, we have spent 40 years building these up. Uh, it's not like we're racing with them either. We haven't got any this year so far. We've, we've not agreed a single one. And 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 we're expecting the foreign secretary to focus on that as well as everything else that they normally do anyway. But anyway, back for the moment to the Trump supporting climate change loving, not denying, sexist. And Thornbury did have another criticism of the proposed appointment, a much more relevant one. She also criticised his lack of experience in international trade matters. Now, this is key because Let's say he'd been Prime Minister of Australia at a time of intense negotiations with major trading partners over a number of years and he was closely involved on a personal level. Then you would think he will have learnt a thing or two and maybe that experience would have stood him in good stead for such a role. You could still argue you'd still be better off with a civil servant with decades of trade negotiation experience but, you know, that would still be valid experience but Tony Abbott doesn't have that experience oh sure he signed some major trade agreements but he didn't negotiate them they were negotiated prior to his uh, appointment as prime minister so he doesn't have proven expertise in international trade negotiations and he doesn't have proven experience and a former Australian high commissioner said appointing Abbott to run our trade negotiations would be as credible as Australia asking Gavin Williamson to take charge of their education system. Gavin Williamson being the education secretary in Britain, whose role has been characterised by constant failure since he was appointed to the post. In fact, as may be told, Tony Abbott only has two qualities that endear him to our post-Brexit utopia. One, he was publicly against Brexit before the referendum, wrote that saying, well, the EU may not be perfect, but Britain can't possibly gain anything by leaving. But then as soon as the referendum was over and the result was out, it was very quickly to actually, do you know what? I was secretly hoping that Brexit would win anyway. So the ability to shift political ground as the wind blows, a uh, very, very useful skill during a Boris Johnson government. The second trait is that he is an admirer of Boris Johnson, along as, as long with uh, Donald Trump as well. So useful, useful. I'm uh, not sure how useful that last quality will be, but we will have to wait and see on that one. But it's his competence more than anything that I am concerned about, because at the end of the day, you know, when you consider our country's reputation, yet if you put someone like that in such a key position, where they're going to be conducting international negotiations, it's not a good look. But if we're honest, if we're going to be completely honest, does it actually further tarnish our reputation? When you consider the way that our reputation has been dragged through the mud by the senior members of the government now, um, is it actually making the situation worse to appoint yet another questionable human being 
to this influential position, especially as he will be an official, not a minister. But what we really need to be doing is appointing the best people to these key positions. That's what actually matters. You know, when it comes to negotiating deals, we can't afford toadies and turncoats. If Boris Johnson has done any service to my country at all, any at all, then all it can be said is that it is to highlight how populists and chances are of no bloody use whatsoever during a crisis. They can make up a crisis and then magically solve the made up crisis that didn't exist to begin with, sure. But when it comes to a real crisis, useless. Covid is a real crisis, they've been bog useless. Brexit is a real crisis, we can't afford people to be bog useless. You know, this is four decades worth of agreements, over a thousand agreements, that we are losing overnight. We have the mother of all games of catch-up and appointing more vacuous chances to key positions is going to be absolutely devastating. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.